the last two issues are always exciting. Now, for sprinting, obviously, it's important too. It really makes a big difference when you're starting to work with young athletes. And we get this a lot, actually, with our endurance, our marathoners, our triathletes, our Ironman athletes, Spartan, whatever obstacle course you might be doing. Anybody who's looking at needing to get into the right amount of pace or steps to get a better race time is going to be dealing with an issue of under or over stride, okay? Now, it's a, it's a tough thing because you're kind of also working with genetics. And as I said, young people start to learn when they watch sprinters, they always see them open up with this big stride. So you see young people often pointing their toes and running because they're trying to create that motion. But later on in their teens, if they have speed, there's a coach that wants to correct that. I'm like, no, we don't want that foot out there. We want the foot here. Or the other one, you get people that work on frequency. Pop, 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 pop and they're not allowing themselves to open up and they're not taking advantage of a top speed mechanic. Coaches, again, that's for you to decide, all right? What I want to show you today is how we can directly target that, both with a load to assist it and also to resist it. You've been watching these video clips before I get started. Where would you put the load for an understrider versus a overstrider? One of the most common issues in any running sport, team sport, sprinting, doesn't matter. Would you put the load on the front of the leg or the back leg for an understrider or an overstrider? Coaches, if you're so smart, give me your answer. So, now, an overstrider. Let's target the overstrider first. Overstrider means the leg ends up too far in front. And as you know from your mechanics, all kind of things go bad when that foot's contacting too far in front of the body. So what we want to be able to do now is we want them to get, again, it's got to be about awareness first, all right? What would you do? You would sit there as a coach. Just relax your leg. You kind of show them, I don't want your leg out here. Coach, think how many times you've done this, right? I don't want your left foot contacting way out here. We need to get that foot back in here. We need to be pulling under. So you physically manipulate that so they have some feeling or cueing of what you want. And then they go to run and your hand's not there and they forget it. Well, enter that exigent hand, all right? The coach's hand. We can put that load, and what we're gonna do here, we're gonna take a 200 gram load, eight ounces, maybe a 400, depending on the athlete. Because he's a big guy, we'll go 400. We're gonna go on the back of the calf. Okay, and just show the audience that, show that. What we've done here now, we've got 400 gram with that belly down. That's gonna be a sort of a heavy distal load. What do you think's gonna happen to that leg when it throws out to the front? Gravity is going to work on that weight. And what gravity is going to do immediately as it swings through is start pulling it down. And what that does is it, it will physically help the athlete bring the leg down earlier and it restricts the amount of flip or forward movement that leg could get. So if you have an overstrider, we load on, the, load on the back of the leg. If we have an understrider, it's the complete opposite. Turn around. We want that leg to flick in front. We want them to experience the opening of that angle. And we load the load on the front. Now, for those of you who've never experienced wearable resistance in user-defined movement training, you may be thinking that's too light, it's not gonna work. Trust me, it works. You only need a very light weight at a fast speed movement to make a big difference. And so now what happens is, the moment that leg accelerates through its recovery phase and starts to come forward, you create a momentum the opposite direction. This load here catches that momentum and pulls that leg up. And so the first thing these two loading patterns will do, on the back for the overstrider, on the front for the understrider, is it makes them aware of the more proper or angle of attack or point of contact with the ground that's getting towards what you're looking for in the stride that you're targeting. And we're gonna give both those a try right now. How did that feel? <laughs> yeah, I wasn't overstriding that for sure. Yeah. That was definitely for sure. So, so if this a person was an overstrider, you, can, you feel how it's bringing that back right. in, correct? Definitely. And as I said, you know, it's all about knowing what you're doing wrong. And I know I overstride. I know. Oh, really? I know I overstride. So that's yeah. why it was actually yeah, this. Was, yeah. So did this feel like something that's, oh, that's where I need to be? 100%. Really? Definitely. Definitely. So yeah. how did it feel also with the weight down low? Harder? When it gets, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, of course. You it starts to feel heavier, right? Yeah, exactly. 
like that. I felt my calves doing moto moto movement. <laughs> the moto moto? Yeah. <laughs> it's a nickname now. Okay, so straight from the horse's mouth, the moto moto's mouth, is, um, is uh, you definitely feel that effect. Now, do you think 200 grams would be enough even? Yes, Yeah. 100%. We did definitely. load him with 400 because he's a strong definitely. athlete, but for coaches starting out, 100, 200 grams, you think yeah. you'd already feel it. Right. All right, let's go to the last one now mm -hmm. for the understriders and uh, see how that feels. So you're battling it now. Right. Yeah. Because it was going that way and I was like, no, I could be that way. Okay, so <laughs> that's really interesting. Now think of his comment. The weight was pulling me where I didn't want to be. So that's what a resistive load should do. So for, for you and, and you're overstriding is something you're working with. Okay. So remember what he said when we put him to help his overstriding. He's like, oh I like that. Of course he liked it because the weight was doing the work. Right. <laughs> but it did make you aware. Yeah, right. Now, he doesn't like this, right? Because <laughs> right. now it's challenging him. So now all those muscles of that posterior chain and even the core that has to stabilize to stop that flick have to work. Now he's being challenged. And what's really important, that also brings us to another point of what we talk about with loading. Because some of you are wondering, well, how much load exactly do I need? These ranges are all there on our website. They're all there on our app, which launches January 1. And they're all there in our, on the, uh, the videos that we have, so easy to find. But what you don't want to do is uh, compromise the athlete. We want to challenge them with the load, but not compromise them. So let me ask you this. You said, man, it was you wanted me to do what I didn't want to do. Right. But could you control it if you put your mind on it? 100%. Yeah. Which is different than if you're pulling a sled or you're doing something where the load is actually overpowering you. Then it's a struggle. So don't turn this product into just another heavy resistance traditional tool. Keep it a coaching technical conditioning tool. So it should challenge you, not compromise your movement, which means the athlete needs to be in control. If you see them too challenged and are compromised, just adjust the load. We got 400 grams on there. We can drop that to three, to two, to one, to 50. So it's designed to do that. And also if he comes back and says, yeah, my split times are way too slow now, the weight's heavy, reduce the weight. Because we want you to be in control and we want you to be on time. And if you're not doing that, you're not sprinting. Exactly. <laughs> um, any other last thought on that pattern? Like you said, a challenge. One thing I would have to say is actually, you know, it makes you think, the you know, coach can say, okay, man, you have to be at a full degree angle. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, I don't know what that means in real, in real life. When I'm in the blocks, I'm not gonna, you know, ain't nobody gonna put a measure and say, okay, now you're in the right position. So this actually puts you in that kind of range or that kind of the angle that the coach is talking about. So mm -hmm. as an athlete, it's, it's a good tool so you know where you, know, where you want to be rather than talking numbers of the 45 degrees, 90 yeah. degrees. And, and, the, and they take your leg and they show you 45, but right. like you said, when you're in the blocks, you're thinking about fast <laughs> as I can. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. I know now we get into the technical side and coaches, this is your expertise. And I know some of the work we do with uh, uh, Dennis Mitchell and, and the group down there in Florida and of course here with Dwayne, he is working on things like uh, hip to knee, knee to ankle, ankle to foot, ankle to toe, all those angles are critical. And if we can get coaches and athletes in a conversation that's relevant during their training, I think we're already gonna be looking at making improvement. Because one thing I know coming from a strength and conditioning background, SNC only helps a little bit. Mm -hmm. But technical improvement always helps track time. Because you can't make a technical improvement and not see it, right? It immediately becomes apparent in, in how you're running. You'll see your split times are better or whatever it is. True? Yeah.